Sherry Clark. Uh, she's a, a colleague of mine and, uh, from Alberta. She's a, a young professor at the Department of uh, Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta. And also she is one of the principals at a company called FIERA Consulting. FIERA Ecological? Biological. Biological. FIERA yeah. Biological Consulting. And um, uh, Sherry and I, we have been, we, we met last year and we have been scheming a few things together in Alberta, mostly on the use of drones to monitor a land cover change on wetlands. And uh, we have about uh, three postdocs working with us right now on how a high resolution drone technology can be used to characterize changes by grazing and other impacts uh, on, on Alberta's wetlands. Uh, it's always interesting to have a different perspective uh, from our Latin American point of view. And uh, I invited uh, Sherry to come and, and talk about uh, market-based methods to look into uh, ecosystem services for wetlands and, and how the government of Alberta is starting to look into the things. And uh, in Alberta, it's very special <laughs> dealing with this because uh, we have been talking about how sometimes farmers don't even let you get in into the land and don't touch it. Don't even talk to me about ecosystem services or anything. So without uh, expanding more uh, on, on this, I want to, to let you go with the cherry and uh, uh, just remind you that we have a bigger audience that, so don't get too close to the camera. Okay. And, uh, uh, but we have a large audience uh, listening to us all around the Latin America, so welcome. And thank, thank you. you for coming. All this I feel terrible because <laughs> she speaks very little Spanish. So talk to her in English, guys. <laughs> it's good practice for you, but I feel terrible. That, uh, uh, so from now on, all the talks will be in English. <laughs> okay, thank you very much thank and welcome. Thanks, Arturo. Um, I apologize for not speaking Spanish. Um, my, my Spanish is getting better. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. <laughs> Um, Arturo uh, gave me a very nice introduction and I think uh, what I would like to talk about today be because I work in the private sector and I and I work with both governments and other companies that are being regulated by the government it's a very unique position because I can see how government policy influences the behavior of corporations and sometimes in very good ways and sometimes in not so good ways and understanding how policy is used by corporations to sort of manipulate um, outcomes or to uh, get positive outcomes that we might be interested in. So it's interesting to look at uh, that the push and pull between the government and uh, private industry that's being regulated. So I wanted to give a bit of background about Alberta because probably a lot of you haven't been to Alberta, but um, it's in Western Canada, um, about more than a thousand kilometers from the ocean. So we're inland. It's quite a large area, uh, about uh, 600,000 kilometers, so about the size of Paraguay, uh, more or less. And Four million people live in Alberta, and most, most people live either in Edmonton, which is a big city of about a million, or in Calgary, uh, which is a little bit bigger than Edmonton. And most of the population is concentrated in the central part of the province. And Alberta is quite diverse in terms of the landscape. So in the, the western part of the province, we have the Rocky Mountains. Um, not as big as the Andes, but still quite nice. Uh, in the southern part of the province, we have grassland ecosystems. So no trees, lots of grasses and, and forbs. Um, in the central and the northern part of the province, we have uh, parkland ecosystems. So mixed trees, deciduous and coniferous, and further north, the boreal forest. And Throughout Alberta, we have wetlands, and we have different kinds of wetlands and, and quite diverse types of wetlands. So in the northern part of the province where this picture was taken, this is in the boreal region, these are called peatlands. So areas where, that are covered with moss, and we have water interspersed throughout the area. And then in the, the, the southern part of the province, 
we have wetlands that look like this. So these are called marsh wetlands or prairie potholes uh, is what most people call them. And they're very numerous on the landscape. And we have a lot of them. And they're in the region of the province where we also have a lot of agriculture. And so when the water is sitting on the landscape, we want to get rid of it so that we can farm and get more productivity out of the lands. But these wetlands are really important from a biodiversity perspective. So we have a lot of species that depend, this is a moose, uh, depend on wetland habitats. Um, and we also have a lot of bird species that actually come from Mexico or Central America and fly to Canada in the summertime and live in the wetlands. Um, and ducks in particular are very important. These prairie pothole wetlands are, are the most important breeding habitat for these species. So if we lose these wetlands off the landscape, all of the breeding areas are gone. So they're very important from a biodiversity perspective. But they also provide a lot of ecosystem services outside of biodiversity. So these areas, uh, when the water flows into them, the water will uh, go through the, the soils and recharge the, the aquifers. Um, these ecosystems also intercept water off the landscape and filter it, so treat water treatment. Um, and they're also uh, places where carbon and nutrients are stored. So from a pers the perspective of climate change and climate moderation, they're also really important ecosystems. They also store water when there's a lot of water falling. It inter it's intercepted by the wetlands, and so from a flood protec protection perspective, they're also really important. So they provide really a, a diverse range of ecosystem services that are really important uh, to human communities. But we've lost a lot of wetlands in Alberta, and the estimates are about 70% of wetlands are already gone. So we have only a very, very few, even though there's still quite a lot on the landscape, the majority of the wetlands that we have are already gone. And most of the losses are in the agricultural areas. So these are the wetlands that used to hold water and the farmer will bring equipment and dig a ditch so that the water will flow out of the wetland. We also are losing wetlands to uh, urban areas. Cities are growing out and as the cities grow they're intercepting wetlands and those wetlands are just filled in and we build over top of them. We also lose wetlands to other industrial activity like forestry and also in northern Alberta uh, we have oil and gas activity, the oil sands. So in this area we use big machinery and clear the land and dig giant holes. Um, and so nothing is left uh, on the landscape after we do this. We also have um, oil and gas activity that fragments the landscape. Um, so here, these are called seismic lines and the oil and gas companies use these lines to try and find the oil dis deposits. Um, and we also have other techniques other than scooping the oil out. Uh, we'll inject steam down into the ground to liquefy the oil so that it flows. So these lines are used to inject the steam into the ground. So we have a lot of different kinds of impacts on wetlands and we, we do have quite a few different policies in Alberta to try and regulate impacts not only to wetlands but to other ecosystems. Um, and the one that I'm going to talk mostly about today is this wetland policy that we have. Um, but it's worth noting that recently our, our government introduced a new climate change policy. And we do have now requirements uh, for industry to pay for carbon. So also through the, the Alberta wetland policy, um, there is a requirement that if you're going to do an activity that impacts a wetland, the government requires you to do that with a permit. So you can't go technically and do work unless you have a permit from the government. 
And once you have that permit, this policy says that when you impact a wetland, you must replace the area of the wetland that's lost. So it's a, comp a compensation uh, policy. And you might be familiar with this idea of the mitigation hierarchy. So a lot of offset policies use this idea of avoid first. And if you can't avoid, then you minimize impacts. And if you can't avoid or minimize, then you must replace or compensate. And so we use this mitigation hierarchy when you go to the government and ask for a permit. They say, can you avoid? Everyone says no. They say, can you minimize? Everyone says no. And so then they say, well, you must replace. And so how do we decide uh, how to replace? So we have a very complicated um, way of evaluating each wetland. And it's the Alberta wetland policy is function based, which means when we evaluate the wetland, wetland we're trying to understand the ecological functions that that wetland provides. So we have a standardized protocol that people like me will use to go out into the field and assess the wetland. And there's 78 different indicators, questions, that I answer when I assess the wetland. And then those indicators are aggregated into these sub-function categories. And these are all ecosystem functions and services. And these are aggregated to four functions. There's another human use, but these are the primary um, ecological. And then we get a score between zero and one, and this score is translated into an A, B, C, or a D. And an A, an A wetland is the highest value wetland, and a D value is the lowest value wetland. So once we know what the value of our wetland is, the government then requires compensation based on the value of that wetland. So if I've assessed a wetland as an A wetland, then I must replace it in some ratio. And this gets a little bit complicated, <laughs> how we calculate the ratios, but basically there are two different ways of replacing wetlands. First, I can do something called an in-lieu fee payment. So that is the opportunity for me just to write a check and give the money to someone else. And they will create and replace the wetland for me. The other option is for me to create my own wetland. Currently, however, this doesn't usually happen in Alberta. And this is the primary mechanism we use to replace wetland habitats. So that's why this column is highlighted, because these are the ratios that we pay. So if I impact an A value wetland, my replacement ratio is eight to one. So for every one hectare of wetland I impact, I must pay to replace eight hectares of wetland. And if I have a low value wetland, the ratio is one to one. Okay. So this is, Im oh, yeah, this is important because we have a policy that says you must replace habitat. And the issue for us is not that we don't have wetlands that we can replace and restore because we have a lot of wetlands that have been impacted. But the issue for us is that most of these wetland impacts have happened on private land. About 40% of the province is owned by private landowners. The other 60% is public land. And most of the public land is in the north. And most of the private land is around Edmonton and Calgary. And most of the impacts that have happened to wetlands are on private lands currently. And so we have a problem because we have a policy that says we must replace, but we have very few private landowners willing to allow us access to these sites to restore them. So I've been involved in a project um, for about three years now um, where we're trying to create incentives for private landowners 
to allow us to come and restore wetlands on their property. And this is a very challenging um, situation because most landowners are not interested in participating with us. And part of the issue here is this difference between the private versus the public benefits. So in most cases, the, there are very few private benefits for a landowner to restore a wetland. And in fact, they incur a lot of nuisance or opportunity costs. When we come onto their property and restore a wetland, now they, if they are farmers, they have to drive around the wetland, they have wildlife coming, and they can cause damage to crops. Um, and the benefits, the ecosystem services that I talked about, most, most of the benefits from those services aren't experienced by the, by the landowner. They're experienced at a larger spatial extent. So we have a mismatch between the private and the public benefit. So for me to explain and talk about ecosystem services and how important they are, that landowner doesn't typically experience those direct benefits. And the trade-off is that they have a lot of nuisance costs or opportunity costs um, that they forego. The other really challenging thing in Alberta is that this is a fairly new policy and previous policies in Alberta actually were paying farmers to drain wetlands. <laughs> so 20 years ago, we were knocking on farmers' doors saying, here's money to drain, and now I'm coming and knocking on their door saying, here's money to restore. Um, but past policies and actions um, have created uh, social attitudes that are very negative and most people don't want wetlands on their property. So that's a, that's a really big challenge. So the, a lot of the economists, and I know there's some economists in the room, they say, well, we just have to offer money. If we offer money, we can overcome um, the problem and we can get people to participate. So that was the focus of the work that I've been doing is asking the question, can we incentivize restoration on private land through a cash payment. And so this is the project, it's called Alberta's Living Laboratory Project, um, and this is the website that we set up to communicate with the landowners that we wanted to engage. And two really big important questions that we wanted to answer is if you have a limited amount of money to spend, where do you spend the money? Which wetlands do you restore? Because different wetlands provide different ecosystem services, and if you're going to use money, you want to target to get the best outcomes. So how do you do that? And that's a difficult proposition. So that's something that we looked at. And then also, a big part of this was just discovering the price of what to pay a landowner, because I don't know what it costs to access a wetland. I can't just go to the grocery store or look on the internet to see what the price of a wetland is. And so we were interested to know what should we expect to pay to access a, a wetland on private land. So in order for us to discover that price, we use something called a reverse auction. So in a reverse auction, um, it's Everyone know what an auction is, where you go and you bid on something? Um, so in a, in a typical auction, you have one seller and many buyers. In a reverse auction, it's, it's the opposite. You have one buyer, who's me, and many sellers. So if you all have drained wetlands, you're the sellers and I'm the buyer. And so I'm soliciting costs from everyone in this room. Okay, so I have a pool of potential bidders who come to me with my bag of money and you tell me what, what you're willing to accept as a payment because what you're willing to accept as a payment might be different than what you're willing to accept. And so we're looking for uh, understanding the, the differences in price. And some people might, might let me come onto their land for zero dollars. And so I want to find those people because then my budget goes further. And if you're very expensive, 
from an economic perspective, that's not efficient. So I want to find the lowest price um, to make the most of my budget. So this is conceptually how a reverse auction works, is that we have some, something that we're evaluating, so it could be a price per hectare, and then we look at and rank the bids according to the price per hectare, and we look at the cumulative, of air, cumulative area that we can restore. So if my first bid, wetland number one, um, that's your wetland, and you're asking $10 a hectare, okay? Second bid comes in, that's your wetland, you're asking for $15 a hectare, okay? So I keep asking for more and more bids until we have a range of costs. In this auction, we have seven participants. The most expensive wetland is $100 a hectare, but I have a limited amount of money to pay, and so I have a budget cap. So these are the winners in my auction. Okay, so everyone, as I buy up, I spend my money, I hit my budget, everyone who's above that loses, and they don't get any money, everyone else wins. <coughs> Okay. In that example, I was talking about area of wetland, but we could also look at environmental benefits. So for example, if I'm interested in how much carbon each wetland stores, I can measure the carbon storage potential and pay per unit, per ton of carbon sequestered. So the interesting thing in this scenario is if we were evaluating based on an ecosystem service, the ranking of the bids in which wetland is high cost versus low cost might change. So if in this scenario, wetland number seven is re reasonably low cost, but in an area, it was the most expensive. So depending on what environmental benefit you're evaluating, you may be selecting different wetlands to restore. Okay. There are two different types of auctions that you can run. Um, one is called a discriminant price auction. So in this case, your $10 a ton, your 20, your 50, your 80. We hit my budget cap and everyone who wins in the auction gets paid $10, 20, 50, or 80. Okay, so you get, what, you get paid what you bid. There's another type of auction called a uniform price auction. And in this auction, everyone who wins gets the same price. And you are paid the cost of the first losing budget, the first losing bid. And the idea here is that if you do a uniform price auction, the incentive is not to ask for more money from me than it costs you to restore the wetland. So in economic theory, this is a more efficient auction because people aren't trying to make profit on the auction. That's the theory. <laughs> so we ran a uniform price auction in the Nose Creek watershed, which is very close to the city of Calgary. So the city of Calgary is a very big city, biggest city in Alberta. We chose this area because restoration in that watershed affects water quality in the city of Calgary. So the city of Calgary receives the benefits of the wetland restoration and the city of Calgary was a partner on the project. So this is what the Nose Creek watershed looks like. There's a lot of agriculture. We have a lot of these prairie pothole wetlands. Most of the agriculture in this area is ranching but there's also intensive uh, cropping production. There's also a lot of urban growth pressure because it's so close to the city of Calgary, uh, the city's expanding, and many of the people who live in the Nose Creek watershed want to retire and they're waiting for someone to come and buy their land. So that is an opportunity cost that factors into how much people are willing to accept as a payment to restore a wetland. So the first thing that we had to do is find the drained wetlands. 
because there is no map in Alberta that tells us where all of these drain wetlands are. And in order for us to identify potential participants in the auction, we had to know who our pool of potential bidders were. So we used remote sensing and, and worked with LIDAR data. So this is the LIDAR data that we used. And in the LIDAR data, you can see very clearly the drainage ditches. So we created this inventory so that we could know which landowners we could then target and knock on their door and ask them to participate. So in this watershed, using that LIDAR technique, we estimated that there were 444 potential wetlands that we could go and restore. And those wetlands were owned by 255 landowners. So now our potential pool of bidders is 255 people. So the second thing that we had to do was convince people to submit a bid to us. So we developed a communication program and communication strategy to let them know about the project and try and persuade them to submit a bid to us. So we did a number of different things. We had a website, social media, and we also had workshops, community meetings, and we also produced a lot of pamphlets and materials that we could mail out to landowners to explain what the project was. Because this has never happened in Alberta before. No one has ever run a reverse auction. So most people didn't know what, what this project was about. So we had an information package um, with brochures. And we mailed those out to every one of those 255 landowners. And then for people who we could find a phone number for, it's difficult to find phone numbers now, we called them and talked to them and told them about the project. Um, and then we had information sessions. So you can see we started with 255. We could only find phone numbers for 125. And then only 12 people came to our information session. We then phoned more people. Um, and tried to recruit more and more people. But every time we did something, there were fewer and fewer people who were interested in participating. And many people, when we called them, they said, don't call again. <laughs> 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 and they hung up the phone. Um, but that was a small number of people. So, so some of them were very hostile and didn't want to participate. Um, and Many of them were interested, but they were suspicious. They, they didn't trust us. Um, and so a big part of this was trying to go into a community where nobody knew who we were and build trust and communicate to them that it's a difficult thing to communicate that we're not there uh, to take advantage of them, uh, that we didn't work for the government and there's a lot of mistrust of the government. So trying to overcome uh, the trust issues was a really big issue for us. But a lot of people who said they, did, they didn't want to participate, some of them were just not interested. They didn't think it was a, a good thing to do. Um, in many cases, we had instances where there was multiple landowners of the same piece of land. So convincing one person was hard. Convincing four people on the same property, nearly impossible. And then a lot of landowners told us they didn't have a wetland. So that was a really interesting thing, um, that we had data that told us they had a wetland that they had drained. And they said, no, no wetland. I have no wetland. So there is also an issue of communicating what is a wetland, um, why is it important, all of these sorts of things. <coughs> So finally, we got to a, a point where we did have some people who were interested. Um, and so then we were in a position to actually run the reversed auction. But we only had five people who were interested. Out of 255, we ended up with five. And one of those people dropped out at the last minute. So we only had four people participate in the auction. But those four people had 14 wetlands. So not, not too bad, and 12.6 hectares. So when we ran the reverse auction, the prices that we received from those four landowners ranged between zero, so one person wanted to donate their wetland, 
to the maximum price of $13,861 a hectare. So that's Canadian dollars. And so in our uniform, because we ran a uniform price auction, all of the landowners were paid $13,000 a hectare. And when they agreed to restore that wetland, they had to sign a contract with us. And the contract terms um, are stated here. And the contract was administered by an organization called Ducks Unlimited Canada, which is a not-for-profit organization that works in Alberta and does a lot of wetland restoration. Um, and so they were the ones who actually administered the contract. And it was a 10-year agreement. Um, and basically, the 10-year agreement said that the landowner would allow us to restore the wetland, and over that 10 years, they weren't allowed to drain it again or to go into the wetland and break the soil or, or, or cultivate it. Um, but it was less restrictive than I would have liked to see because they were still allowed to take water out of the wetland if they wanted to, or they could also use the wetland for their cattle to graze. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a very restrictive um, lease at all. And the 10 years is also not a very long period of time. And it was because if we had extended that period, probably would have zero people interested in participating. So the length of the contract was a very important consideration for us um, because the length is a huge barrier to participation. So when we look at the actual cost that we paid for this wetland, the, the payment to the landowner is only a portion of what it costs us to restore. So that's a big, big ticket item for us. But th there's other costs associated with actually restoring the wetland. Because we have to go out with equipment and put in a ditch plug and pay people to do that work. There is also costs associated with me calling people to convince them, printing materials. So ultimately, um, our estimates of costs were around $23,000 per hectare. What year? Uh, per hectare. What time is year or 10 years? Uh, for 10 years, okay. yep, yep. And what's interesting about that $23,000 is that the government has a schedule that tells you how much, if you're going to pay to restore a wetland, how much you have to pay. And in this area, which is where we were working, the government only charges $17,700. For me, if I want to drain a wetland, that's the price I have to pay for compensation. But if I want to restore a wetland, it costs me $23,000. So there is a mismatch in terms of how much it costs to restore versus destroy. So the, the other interesting thing that we would like to do, and this is work that still has to happen, um, is now we have an inventory for that whole watershed of where every single drained wetland is. And so now we have an opportunity to estimate the potential function. If we were to s restore those wetlands, we could estimate how much does e each wetland uh, the biodiversity it provides, the flood protection, the nutrient removal, so quantify ecosystem services for every one of those drained wetlands and run a simulated auction to look at which wetlands would we select if we were interested in carbon sequestration or nutrient removal. Or maybe we're interested in bundling more than one ecosystem service together to try and find which wetlands give us the best value for the money that we're going to spend. So that's still work that we're, we're hoping to do. The really important part of this is if you're going to restore a wetland, and this is, you know, big differences between conserving and paying for ecosystem services of an ecosystem that already exists versus one that you're now restoring. So one of the big questions is, when we restore, do those functions come back? And how quickly do those come back? And so part of what we're interested in looking at is, as the wetland gets older through time, 
how does the ecosystem services and ecosystem function return? And what is the rate and the amount of that function that's returned on the landscape? And do we ever get to a point where the restored wetland functions like a natural wetland? So this is an example of uh, what we might be looking at. So this is the time since restoration, so young wetlands and older wetlands. And this is um, the density. We took soil cores in the, in the middle of the wetland and looked at how, how many pores were in the soil. And um, lower soil bulk density allows more water to filter through the soils which means the wetland can store more water, which means it has greater flood storing potential. So we're interested in this relationship and whether or not it's linear, is it exponential, and, and how quickly do we reach a point um, where we're happy with the functioning and are our contracts the right length? So if we only pay to, to maintain a wetland for 10 years, do we get the ecosystem benefits of a longer contract? So this is some of the work that Arturo was talking about. We're interested to know, can we use uh, a drone to monitor the recovery of wetlands? Um, because it's very expensive to send people like me, a, a biologist in the field, on the ground, um, to do that work. And so we're interested to know, are drones a good tool to remotely sense the wetlands? Um, so this is some of the uh, imagery and the, the classification that we've been uh, doing with our drones. Um, and initial, the initial results, we've only been doing it for less than a year. The, the initial results are promising, um, but there's still some uh, big issues that we need to work out with the drones. And one of the things is just calibration of the sensors to make sure that what we're measuring is reliable um, and that we can trust the data that we're getting from our drones. But this question of when we restore a wetland and we've paid for ecosystem services, do we get those services back is a really important policy question if we're going to have a policy that requires us to compensate and pay for that compensation. So, in, in closing, um, there's some, some thoughts uh, just to leave you with. And the first one I think that's really important is that conservation versus restoration and paying for conservation of lands that already exist versus paying for restoration is a very different paradigm for ecosystem services. And we have to think we have to think about them a little bit differently and there's different <laughs> kinds of challenges. And in our experience, a lot of the farmers that we talked to were not interested in restoring, but they were interested in conserving. So the first question they asked was, will you pay me to keep this wetland? And we were not interested in that, um, but that's something that's really interesting. Probably the participation rates would be much higher if we were paying for, for retention rather than restoration. The other thing that's very important is that we were dealing with different levels of government. So provincial or state government had policies, but the municipality, the local governments also had policies and regulations. And those two government policies and regulations didn't always agree and oftentimes worked against each other. And so we had to really negotiate those differences between the way governments were thinking about wetlands and wetland restoration. The other thing when you're working with private landowners, um, trust is a really big issue and um, building trust takes time and it takes resources and so we found it really difficult um, to convince people to participate without diverting a lot of resources towards knocking on doors or, or, or having conversations. And so there's a lot of resources that are needed to invest in just establishing positive relationships with potential landowners. Um, probably our biggest issue is with the negative social attitudes that people had against wetlands. Um, and 
we had conversations with people who said, you can't pay me enough. There's, there's no amount of money that I will take to restore the wetland. And so um, I think that is interesting because there's a lot of thinking that if the payment is high enough, we can incentivize that behavior. And I think for the majority of people that is true, but there's a small percentage of people where money, it's, it's not just about money, it's also about social attitudes and, and perspectives. Um, and then the other thing that I think, if you're going to have a payment for ecosystem service program, you must collect enough money to cover the costs of the payment. So in Alberta, what we charge people to destroy a wetland is too low because it costs us more to actually pay someone to restore it. So from an economic perspective, um, that's not very efficient. And that's it. First one, just a comment. Uh, it would make sense that the differential between restoration cost and uh, the payment for destroying would be the appropriate payment for conserving. So that's approximately uh, what a four thousand dollar difference, i.e., four hundred dollars a year over the ten, uh, ten year period yeah. that you're taking into account, which seems a reasonable kind of level to entice people to conserve with land. That might be an idea. Yep. But the questions are uh, have to do with the restoration effort itself. You're not doing anything. You're not implanting anything. You're just letting it fill up with water. You're even allowing them to have cattle go in there, which potentially turns the whole thing into a mud puddle. Uh, uh, there, you, I, I saw you had a dragonfly in one of your logos, you don't do mosquito control, or any of the other negatives that are associated with, with wetlands uncontrolled, right? Yep. So, th so this was a major issue because the, the government of Alberta told us we, we had to work with Ducks Unlimited. So the province only recognized Ducks Unlimited as the qualified restoration agent. Ducks Unlimited restores wetlands, that's what they do, that's their primary business. Their method for restoration is a ditch plug, and that's all they do. We were interested as a research program to try different restoration techniques. So status quo versus planting versus, you know, different experimental design to look at whether or not the rate and the yield of ecosystem function return changed with the restoration treatment. Um, the government told us we weren't allowed to do that. So this is you know, one of the huge barriers to advancing our understanding about ecosystem restoration, payment for ecosystem services, um, that the government also has to be willing to participate and take risks, I guess, and, and work with new uh, organizations. That's, that's a fundamental attitude problem because in, in, if I go across into the US, there is uh, a desire for restored yeah. wetlands, especially in suburban settings. Nice reed beds and willows and all the works and bicycle paths through it is, is something highly valued. Yeah. Uh, but if, of course, the only thing you get is a mud puddle with a couple of cows around it, it's not so attractive. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It was really nice for us to Thanks. Clear. Everybody understands. Good. <laughs> so my, my question is in the same line. The first one. To, um, do you think they will be? How how long these wetlands are already without water? The ones you are restoring, and it will be other negative impacts in hmm. the, because the ecosystem already changed. Do you think they are other environmental negative impacts? That's the, the first one. And the airborne lidar. It was. Airborne, or airborne. airborne, yeah, yeah. So the question about how long have the wetlands been drained, we don't know. Um, but I suspect the success of the restoration is dependent on how long since the drainage happened. So um, the other issue is that when farmers dig that ditch, sometimes 
all of the water goes and sometimes only a little of the water goes. And in instances where water still remains, we call that incomplete drainage, uh, those wetlands are better for restoration because we have a better chance of bringing back the ecosystem uh, because it, the disturbance level is lower. Um, but these, these types of wetlands are, are very, um, the plant ecosystems are driven by the hydrology, the water. So when we put the water back, um, they do recover, but the time that it takes once we restore the water to coming, you know, matching a natural wetland might take a very long time. And if we can shorten that amount of time it takes from drained to natural function, then that's something that we should be trying to do. And understanding the, the variables that drive the, the rate of return of ecosystem function is important. Um, and that's not something that we were looking at in this project, but it's certainly something um, through other, uh, my research interest is to look at questions like that. And then also, if we do different restoration techniques, can we shorten the amount of time between no function and complete function? Yeah. Can you explain why you went to the constant cost uh, or a reverse option? What, what's the advantage of taking that highest winning bid instead of buying everything at right. the lowest possible cost? Yeah, so the idea there um, is to prevent rent seeking in your bid pricing. Because if you're doing a uniform auction, um, you want to be a winner. And if you submit a bid that's too high, you run the chance of losing the auction. So the incentive, because everyone gets paid more than they bid in a uniform price auction, you always get paid more than you bid. And so the incentive is to bid as close to your cost without trying to rent seek. So that's the theory behind it. Whether or not um, it actually plays out, I think a lot of economists are still asking that question. And part of the, the issue for us, especially because we had so few participants, we didn't have a real market. And so it's really difficult. This, this is the other important thing. Governments need to, if they're going to create markets for ecosystem services, they have to participate in making sure there is a viable market because these markets don't just create themselves. There needs to be, especially initially, um, some government functions and structures to ensure that this type of system can be rolled out and works efficiently. Um, and I think in Alberta, the government's attitude is the market takes care of itself and <laughs> they don't have to be involved. But these designer markets need intervention from government to make sure that they function properly. This project, did you work in with Vic Adamovics? Mm -hmm. Is a professor in Alberta? Yeah. Yep. yep. I see. I saw one photo, one picture. Yeah, he was at the yeah. workshop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question for for a few people, people. Have you guys explored the possibility for using uh, action for uh, some of the projects in the Costa Rica's uh, allocation, or, or have thought about it, thinking about it? Never, never got the idea. <laughs> So reverse auctions are used in Australia a lot. There's, uh, they are the one jurisdiction that has used them most successfully. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there are questions also for the previous presenter. Yeah, so we have Does the biodiversity certified wine come with a plate of snails? <laughs> From the vineyard snails. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Sherry. Sherry, okay. I have a question for you. Uh, I know that Dobson Dimitri has a very strong footprint in Alberta, and in fact, it's extremely expensive to work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mapping of one satellite image alone 
to a church and have a thousand dollars. So it doesn't look to me that much as profit, yeah. non-profit or anything else. But what is the, the perspective of this project to continue to move up into Northern Alberta in areas that are a little bit more, I'm not talking about, what would you explain to the people that in the white zone and the green zone, <laughs> but uh, in the Peace River area, all agricultural areas and so forth, that could be another area to, to look into. So what is the possibility that this project can expand to other parts of the province outside of city, boundaries of cities, which seems to me the areas that are more expensive, and they may not like it. the main reason for it. They may not like it because they are land speculators. Uh, they, what they're doing is they're waiting. Oh, Calgary and Edmonton are expanding. I'm getting ten thousand bucks for ten years. Meanwhile, next week I can sell the land for half a million dollars to a developer, and that the city will expand to a new one. So, what is the possibility that to look into areas outside of big cities and more towards the truly rural areas of Canada? Yeah. So it's something that we're interested in doing. Part of the reason why we worked in near Calgary was because the city of Calgary was giving us the money to pay the landowners. So the issue is where do you find the money to pay landowners to restore wetlands? In this case, the budget was provided by the city of Calgary. Um, but again, if the provincial government would eliminate barriers so that I could take money from the wetland compensation fund, and go to Peace River and run a reverse auction, that would be the best case scenario. But there's a lot of barriers that the government has put in place for me to be able to do that. And the, and the wetland compensation comes from people destroying wetlands. That's right. What are the possibilities of the, the, the land compensation fund because of the storage capacity of, of right. the carbon of these lands can actually get money from the carbon tax? I think that that's definitely coming. I think. Right now, the issue is for the scientists to come up with good methods for quantifying how much carbon is stored in the wetlands. Wetlands are difficult, too, because when you restore a wetland, they actually initially release carbon and methane when you re-wet the sediments. So in the first initial years, they are net producers of carbon rather than storing carbon. And so there's some challenges there from a carbon perspective, but I think uh, being able to measure carbon storage more precisely will allow us to tap into budgets from carbon pricing. Now, one, one final question is, is, you're talking about developing new techniques and stuff like that, but you said that the Ducks Unlimited is plug and play, yeah. literally, literally how they play. So it seems to me that one of the major hurdles to, to a wetland conservation is actually the people that manage the land, the wetland conservation program. Because they're not, I know, they're not open to absolutely anything in their way or the highway. Yeah, agreed. And I think uh, the Ducks Unlimited and the government have a long standing relationship. The government trusts Ducks Unlimited to do the work, and it's very difficult to break into that market. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge for, for someone like me who comes from private industry and there's a lot of advantages and innovation that can come with inviting more people into that space of restoration. But the government has to create a process and structures to allow new entrants into that market. And they, to date, have not done that.